you can't strengthen an inhibited muscle. Hey, it's Alicia from MobilityMastery.com and I wanna to talk to you about muscle inhibition today. And as we're filming this right now, we are currently in open enrollment for a brand new program of mine on solving pelvic instability, which has a lot to do with muscle inhibitions. It could mean your deep core is inhibited, uh, maybe a glute muscle is inhibited, maybe a back muscle is inhibited, but muscle inhibition is kind of a central theme in pelvic instability, and it really got me thinking about this head to toe. So even if you are not considering joining my pelvic instability course, or uh, you know maybe you're watching this later, or maybe you think you don't have pelvic instability, this is a topic that should interest you, and you should at least know this information so that if you ever encounter a scenario where a muscle is inhibited, you're gonna know what to do about it and what it actually means. So uh, I'm pretty fired up about this. And the number one thing that I'm wanting people to take away from all of this uh, information I've been putting out on pelvic instability is that you can't strengthen an inhibited muscle. So if you look up the definition of inhibited at say dictionary.com or anywhere else, you're gonna see phrases like forbidden, restricted, prohibited. Um, and that's literally what it means. If you have an inhibited muscle, it means it cannot fire on command. So if you have been told, say, by a physical therapist or a chiropractor or a personal trainer or anyone else that you're working with on your body that you have, say, lazy glutes or a lazy core or core muscles that aren't firing or activating, uh, or glutes that aren't activating, or if we're talking other parts of your body, maybe something like your lats aren't firing in your upper body or your subscap isn't firing to stabilize your shoulder, and that could be part of a shoulder pain uh, pattern, then the worst thing you could do in that scenario is immediately try to strengthen that muscle. But this is the most common thing that I see people doing with their patients and their clients out there is they'll assess them with having an inhibited muscle, which is a good thing to assess, right? But then they'll take them immediately into something like strength training. So they'll go from assessment and diagnosis of lazier or inhibited muscles straight to uh, activations and strength training of those inhibited muscles. But the thing is you can't strengthen an inhibited muscle. <laughs> Why? It's inhibited. What's it inhibited by? Your brain, your brain and your nervous system. So your brain and your nervous system are responsible for keeping you safe at all times. And an inhibited muscle is usually that way due to two primary uh, patterns that I see. Number one would be uh, if there's a reciprocal inhibition pattern at play, uh, then the opposite muscle of whatever is inhibited is too tight and restricted, and it's not allowing its opposite to fire. So the common example that I like to give just visually here on a YouTube video would be something like your biceps. In order for your biceps to contract, the triceps have to stretch. Um, in order for your hamstrings to contract, your quads have to stretch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so if you are trying to fire that muscle and it's inhibited by its opposite, but you're not taking care of releasing the tissue there so that it can actually lengthen, then you're just going to compensate. But the other uh, primary reason, which I see more often than the reciprocal inhibition one, but, but that is somewhat common too. The other pattern would be that your brain is actually locking down a muscle uh, for compensation due to instability for some reason. And this is why it all, for me, most of the time this comes back to pelvic instability because uh, for example, even in my own body, I've had knee pain, uh, and mid back pain and shoulder pain and even wrist pain. That's all do all on the left side, all due to pelvic instability. Uh, so, and that, that's just me. My, some of my clients might have, uh, you know, even something like elbow tendonitis or tension headaches or uh, neck pain due to pelvic instability. And I'm not saying it always comes back to that, but a lot of the time it does. And the reason is if your pelvis is unstable, 
meaning one or more core muscles are not firing perhaps, or um, if you're in pelvic instability due to fascial imbalances, your brain has perceived that your spine is potentially in danger. So if your brain perceives that you are endangering uh, your spine or say a sh your shoulder or your hip, then it will compensate with other muscles neurologically to keep you stable as best it can. Um, it will compensate with whatever it can, uh, either through movement or like I just mentioned, that kind of neurological contraction where your brain is telling a muscle to hold tight almost 24 seven to create stability where it perceived, perceives there isn't any. And the number one thing that your body's gonna protect with a neuro neurological contraction like that is your spine and your spine needs to rest on a stable pelvis. So all of this, you know, that, that pelvis can translate then upstream or down, downstream to the lower body. Uh, so I hope this is making sense. Give me a thumbs up or a comment below if it is. Um, and if it isn't, you could comment as well. I'm happy to talk to you about this. Uh, but this is the number one conversation I keep having with the people who are enrolling in my program right now. And a lot of you emailing me to, to kind of ask your questions. Um, is you might need to stop certain activities that are causing compensation in order to find the root cause. So how you find the root cause is you have to use fascia release to map your body to figure out what is inhibiting the muscle. Is it due to reciprocal inhibition or is it due to a neurological brain signal telling that muscle to clamp down to stabilize you and thus it's not able to activate for its normal duties through something specific like a hamstring, an acute hamstring curl or a deadlift or a squat, uh, or in the case of the upper body, maybe, you know, weightlifting with arm stuff, uh, or doing a plank or anything like that. Uh, so this is, can, this can be a somewhat complex topic, but, uh, it, I want to try to simplify it here, here for you towards the end. Um, what I want you to really just take away from this is mostly you're probably going to need to work with somebody to discover you have an inhibited muscle. Um, or in my program, we're going to go through a process where anyone who joins is going to kind of figure that out with me, but I, I am the professional guiding them through that. Uh, they are kind of doing it for themselves. Most of the time, you're not going to know a muscle is not firing on your own. You might suspect it, but most of the time you're going to be told by somebody. So what I really want you to take away from this video is if that person is, you know, giving you a good diagnosis and I put it in quotations because it may not be a medical professional, um, but they are assessing that a muscle is not firing, then you need to ask them, why do you think this muscle isn't firing? And if they can't answer you, they probably can't help you solve it. They've given you an amazing and really relevant clue to what's happening in your body, but you need to figure out why that muscle has become inhibited before you try to activate it. So I'm going to dial us back to the glutes and the deep core right now. And then you can extrapolate what I'm about to share to any muscle in your body. So think about if you, know, if you have a, a, an inhibited deep core, let's say, which is my personal quest right now is to activate my deep core. If you have an inhibited deep core and you try to activate it, for me, what happens in my body when I try to do that, which is the primary message that I was getting from personal trainer after personal trainer after doctor um, and uh, you know chiropractors, um, but mostly in the movement field is like, you gotta strengthen your core, your core seems weak, you have anterior pelvic tilt, you gotta work that deep core. So they would immediately put me into deep core activations and what happens is when I do that without activation available to me because it's inhibited, remember, then my low back and my neck muscles and maybe my hip flexors all come in to work for my core to stabilize my spine through something that's really the, a movement that does require core activation to keep the spine stable. So I compensate. And when I compensate with those areas, especially say my low back, I further inhibit the deep core. So I am now creating a perpetual cycle where the harder I try to activate it, the more I compensate and the more I compensate, the more inhibited 
inhibited it becomes. And the same thing can be true with glutes. And I went through that process in 2013 and 2014, trying to solve why glutes don't fire and then getting mine firing again. And what I discovered is that I like, I'm amazing at compensating because I understand how a movement should be performed. So for example, if a personal trainer who I had told at the time, my glutes aren't firing, I need to strengthen my gluteus medius, they would put me oftentimes through squats and deadlifts and other complex body movements and I could perform them perfectly. Why? I'm amazing at compensating and so are you probably. Uh, even if you don't execute movements like perfectly, uh, your body is amazing at compensating. So you're going to compensate with something to perform a movement. Your body is most of the time going to allow you to move, but when it can't compensate anymore, you get a pain signal. Uh, so I hope you're taking this information and you're going to run with it. So if it, you know, if we're talking glutes, you got to go to your legs, you got to go to your quad fascia, your quad hip flexor fascia, your adductor fascia, you got to map that lower body to figure out why your glutes have probably been recruited by your brain to stabilize you for a lack of pelvic stability. And then in the case of deep core, we want to look at, is it inhibited because it's actually tight itself due to abdominal surgeries, scar tissue in that region, um, anything else, you know, like that or digestive issues, tension here, or is it actually just inhibited due to its opposites? Remember reciprocal inhibition being really tight. So that was my, that was the reason for me having pelvic instability with deep core inhibition in particular, it was actually a reciprocal inhibition issue or is, um, currently I'm still working on fully resolving it, but I had low back lordosis or an excessive curvature in the low back, uh, a lot of low back tightness. And then I fell on my tailbone when I was 17 roller skating really hard and created a whole bunch of dense scar tissue and adhesions in my left tailbone glute area. And because it was so dense and restricted, I just had no, that area, my tailbone, my sacrum could not move. And if you can't really move your, your tailbone and your sacrum, you cannot contract your deep core. It's just not going to happen. So no amount of me trying to strengthen or activate those muscles was ever going to work until I took care of the reason it, it was inhibited. So in my case, I had to go into my tailbone and my glutes and my sacrum and my low back fascia and release it all. And I have more work to, to do there as well. Um, and then I started having articulation of my hips and my pelvis, and I actually could activate my deep core. So you got to do it in a really strategic manner, figure out what's causing the inhibition, take care of that, and then go into activation. And only when you know for sure it's activating, do you want to progress to strengthening and then full body movements. And then once you're there, you're off to the races and you should be able to go do whatever you want in your life. Uh, so I would love to know if this feels relevant to you. Like, do you feel like you have some kind of pelvic instability, glute inhibition, deep core inhibition, um, but maybe additional muscles in your body. The other common uh, muscles that don't fire would be something around the rotator cuff and shoulder. That's the most common that I see, um, but it could also be in the lower body <clears throat> uh, where you might get calf cramps because the calf muscle is inhibited by a tight tibialis anterior. Uh, so it could ha really happen anywhere in your body. So I'd love to hear from you if this is making sense and you feel like you can apply this right away to get yourself out of pain. I really hope so. I have head to toe techniques here on the channel. And if you're watching this right now, like as we're releasing this video in March of 2020, and you want to join the solving pelvic instability program, you can check out the links below this description. I know there's just a few short days and, uh, until we close it, but, um, and this video will stay up for a while. So if you're watching this down the road, check out the resources that we have for you. The free resources below this video, uh, if it's at a later date. And I hope you'll consider joining me for this five week program. I'm really excited to walk everyone through it step-by-step, step, uh, because you really do need that strategic approach. But if nothing else, I really hope you take away from this that you can't strengthen an inhibited muscle.